Hey, everybody. <laughs> well, that was a big experiment. Uh, some people heard it, some people did not, but uh, we tried to have an intro to everybody <laughs> for the animation podcast. But uh, thank you guys, everybody, for, for being here. Good to see everyone. Uh, man, we have everyone here. I hope you guys are uh, doing all right. Thank you for joining us. I hope you had a great week. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thank you for bearing with us on that kind of stuff. It's so funny. Like some people heard the music, other people didn't. I it's heard it. It's okay. It's all good. It's okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I say, um, thank you everyone for joining us. It's good to see some familiar names and faces. And um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, this will essentially be a, this is fun, guys. This is really fun. This is going to be a, a continuation of uh, uh, Clay and James's um, uh, discussion from the animation podcast. So uh, we are honored today to be hosting uh, James Baxter, the man himself in the building. James, welcome, welcome, sir. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Yeah, Good to be here. Um, I don't think we've ever talked before. Um, and Clay Cadis. Uh, so it's good to have you on, on on this panel too, Clay. It's good to see you, man. It's been a bit. Good to see you it's too. Been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. You have the highest resolution camera of anyone on Zoom, and I, I, I'm jealous. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta. Like, I gotta upgrade. I'm, I'm, in, I'm interlaced though. Is it all choppy? It's kind of gross. <laughs> oh yeah, that's weird. That's weird. Like when you did that with your hand. That's what you get with a 12 year old camera. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Okay, so well, essentially, like I was talking uh, before, guys, uh, uh, this will be a continuation of Clay and James's discussion from the Animation Podcast. Um, if you haven't checked out Animation Podcast before, um, Clay has archived all of the episodes at animationpodcast.com. So check that out, um, where, you know, essentially he takes deep dive conversations with animation industry giants, James being. Um, you know, one of them, of course, Glenn, Andreas, and and uh, Milt Call, right? You you conjured the, the spirit. Yeah, of I got Call. a recording from uh, <laughs> John Musker gave me a tape from Cal Arts, so we got a <laughs> Milt Call one up there too. Amazing, amazing. What what year was that playing? Really quickly, like did you start? Like when I did the podcast? Yeah, when you when oh the first episode. Uh, probably two thousand five is when I started. I I think. Uh, when did James and I do ours? Let's see. I got notes here. I got notes. 90, no, 2008, I think was ours. Yeah, 2008. February 2008 is when I talked to James. That's yeah. incredible. incredible. We've been meaning to get back together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is the perfect time. Uh, yeah, guys, when I was working on my demo reel and trying to just kind of like break into the industry, I would, I don't know if anyone else does this, but like while you're working, you just kind of put something on the background on loop but just kind of like um just something inspiring to keep you going while you're working those kind of late nights of like 12 to 3 in the morning and that kind of stuff and that's what the animation podcast was for me it, it, it meant so much and i listened to all of the no joke i listened to all of the episodes several times several times so thank you uh clay for doing that um it really got me through some tough times um but uh you know they're all super inspiring and it kind of felt like they brought the animation industry to me, you know, uh, in my little part of the world and, you know, um, which is like one of the goals of Rise of Animation too, of just kind of like to close that gap of wherever you are in the world. And we want to provide these resources to you. And hopefully you could feel like you have met these, you know, luminaries and, and, and we kind of want to, you know, kind of close the gap a little bit. So, um, so let's, we can get started with introductions. Um, James, hey. I need to see what those posters are. Oh, nice, beautiful. Yeah, they're old, um, they're old British uh, underground, you know, Metro type posters. Oh man, I love that, that's really cool. Um, so for everyone, um, so some formal introductions. Uh, James Baxter has worked as an animator for Disney and you got to start on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And how old were you? You were like... I was 20, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 1920, something like that. Got it, got it, got it. Um, so he's also worked on, uh, as an animator on The Little Mermaid um, and was a supervising animator at the 
age of 23, correct me if I'm wrong, James. Yeah, I believe 23 so. for Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. It's probably bringing you back. <laughs> I saw it light up in your eyes of like a 23 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Nuts as that sounds. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you're only 27 now, right? That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've just been working really hard, that's all. Um, and so he was also the supervising animator of Rafiki and The Lion King and Quasimodo from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, James then moved to DreamWorks, where he worked on Prince of Egypt, Spirit, Shrek 2, and um, after that, he started his own studio. You started your own studio. Um, James Baxter Animation, which produced um, the hand-drawn animation for Disney's Enchanted, which is beautiful, man. Really beautiful. And then the opening sequence of um, DreamWorks Kung Fu Panda, which is very iconic. Very iconic. Um, and uh, uh, James uh, then returned to DreamWorks Animation on uh, to work on How to Train Your Dragon 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Uh, the cruise, and now um, after doing a hundred different things uh, in between that, uh, he's the director of character animation at Netflix. That's right. Yeah. 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 And oh, also James is a uh, horse bouncing on a beach ball from it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I am that too. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so uh, Clay Cadis. Our, our uh, guest host for today. Thank you, Clay, for doing this, by the way. Yeah, you don't have to do, uh, explain too much of who I am. We, we, James is the main attraction here. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care what you say. It's, it's, it's our panel. Uh, Clay Cadis is a director, screenwriter, and animator. He started at Disney Animation as an intern on their hand-drawn films. Was it Pocahontas? Yep. yep. Oh, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you telling that story. Uh, after that, man, 19 years later, he was the head of Disney's CG animation department, um, supervising animator on Tangled, which I think is unmatched in terms of CG animation still. And I worked on those other films after that, but I, we couldn't hold the candle to that Tangled, in my opinion. Um, Clay then left Disney to direct his first film, um, the Angry Birds movie. Another all... unrivaled movie, yes. What's that? Another unrivaled CG film. <laughs> no, seriously. And then, uh, and, uh, and then followed that up with his live action directing debut, The Christmas Chronicles for Netflix, which I love. Um, and so Clay is currently directing two animated peanut specials for Apple TV. Man, you've been busy <laughs> since <laughs> these animation podcasts. So much has changed. Um, and so just to get a little bit in the animation podcast, 2005, like uh, Clay said, um, just guys, like a series of interviews with just kind of my heroes, our heroes, our animation industry heroes. And um, I think it stopped around like 2012, but you know, Clay put it up there just to keep the inspiration going. And before this, I, I listened to them all again and it all kind of like brought me back and man, uh, they're still so inspiring. So they're, they're kind of evergreen in that way. Um, and yes, this is being recorded. Um, and I will say really quickly before we get in our get into our conversation, um, at the end we're gonna do we're gonna try to um, do a uh, live Q and A. Uh, and if at the end you want to come forward um, and be brought on camera, um, we just ask that you you know agree to uh, be recorded and have your image and voice shared on YouTube later because that's eventually where we'll be putting it. So just to make sure you guys are okay with that. I think you guys all will be, but just wanted to put that out there just to you know cover all our bases. Um, or you can just turn in the camera. But without further ado, I've talked long enough. Um, we can get into the conversation uh, and catch up with James Baxter and Clay Cadis. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, hey, James. Hey, Clay. Uh, thanks, Bobby. And thanks, Rise Up. I mean, you guys do an amazing thing. Obviously, I don't know if everyone knows, but my wife is Monica, one of the founders of Rise Up. So I see what you guys are doing all the time. So I'm really happy to be able to offer something of value to you guys. Finally, I've been busy, but I'm glad that we could do this. So thanks, James, too. Yeah, you're welcome. I think it's so amazing what you guys are doing. It's really important. And that's really yeah. very cool. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, me too. Um, I don't want to talk too much about myself because this really is you are the the main attraction here but uh, like bobby said i actually got hired on hunchback that was my first like official job but i helped on pocahontas which came out first yeah. um 
but I, I was in airway, the building that we were working in, and I was downstairs and I had to walk up these little back stairs and James's office was right there in the corner. And uh, Sean Jimenez and I would go up and bother I, him all the time. I always like to pick um, offices in the corner by the back stairs. It's like, uh, good, good. <laughs> no, I like to be able to escape quickly. <laughs> Yeah, sneaky getaway. Yeah, it, I I noticed that. You know, we would go up there and let's go talk to James. We knock on the door. No one. You're yeah. gone. <laughs> and nobody knew I was gone either. Um, let's see. You know, I, I I went back and I listened to our podcast, which I would uh, argue is the greatest interview with you ever made. Um, well, that was all you, man. Uh, you well, got great questions because. Yeah. And it was it was at a time. Uh, it was 2008. You had started your studio. We were in Pasadena in your office there. I remember. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just like, honestly, like I started my podcast for selfish reasons, just so I could, you know, have an excuse to like <laughs> rattle you with all these questions and ask all these things that I personally wanted to know. And, uh, and, uh, so this is going to be like, you know, Bobby said a continuation of that and maybe go a little deeper. You know, I listened to, again to like the, the Bancroft brothers, you were on their podcast a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. They, you know, they asked, asked all the same questions I asked already. So, uh, you know, we're going to go deeper. <laughs> I, like, I like to give Tony a hard time. Um, he always gives everyone a hard time. Yeah. But um, so I, I don't want to spend too much time like on your history. Bobby did a really great job of covering that. But um, I did, I was a little curious though. Like, you know, you started animating uh, on Roger Rabbit like at 19 mm -hmm. and you were going to school for about a year for animation before that. But like, what were you doing and that's these are questions that i think will help some of the people listening and watching what did you do to um kind of prepare yourself to become an animator like when you're young i know you you know were into visual effects which is very odd like i think our careers are very or our motivations are very similar i wanted to be like a special effects guy you know i read sin effects i thought that's what i was going to do and look at me i'm an animator and you have the same sort of thing but like mm -hmm what like once you were like i'm going to be an animator what did you do like what did you did you start thinking about studying and how did you like when i was when i was yeah in my teens right in like 14 15 i didn't have like this i want to be an animator thing it wasn't i my my brain wasn't as focused as that it was like i'm really interested in this and i just want to do it there wasn't a, like a an end goal for me it's just like oh my gosh this is incredibly fascinating i want to try it i want to do it so it wasn't like I had a goal of like I wanted to be an animator. So um, yeah, the, the first thing, and, and I was always drawing as, as a kid, right? And I've said that a lot, but um, it was a, a way for me to kind of do, you know, drawing, but do this sort of film, visual effects experiment, magic trick kind of, th I really want to try doing this. Uh, and so I guess my preparation for being an animator revolved around obviously having done a lot of drawing and continued to be in art classes in school uh, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, took some life drawing, um, you know, when, you, when you're like, uh, you know, 14, 15, you know, life drawing is, is usually your school friends with their clothes on, you know, in class. Uh, but like before you, you, know, you graduate to actually being able to study anatomy properly. Um, uh, and then, uh, obviously, w watching a lot of stuff on video, I, I am kind of largely self-taught, I would say. Um, but I watched a lot of things on video. I framed through a lot of things on video, uh, like right when VCRs got the ability to do frame by frame. Uh, I would frame through all sorts of cartoons and live action and all sorts of things, just because I was interested in it, not because right. I... I want to train myself to be an animator. Yeah, no, so you're just like, and, and this is what I, you know, I, I started really late. I was like 20 when I thought of becoming an animator. Yeah. And so I realized there's all, all this information I had to like, just ingest, you know, yeah. like I, I, and as I, I could. as I read more about it, I learned that, Oh, there's special paper that you're supposed to use with holes and pegs and stuff like that. Uh, and you know, my first stuff was like most people where you kind of improvise paper with, with peg holes and you use like regular punched paper and you mm -hmm. improvise like a three, you know, you know, some pegs to put it on. And it was paper on the ground in my bedroom, super eight camera on a tripod pointing at the ground with a, a clicker that I had saved up to buy, just like a, one of those old wire clickers that you could do frame by frame. So you wouldn't uh, nudge the camera, right? Yeah, and actually it was good because the camera was good enough. It was my grandfather's camera that we had inherited and it was a good enough camera that it could do a single frame. 
you didn't have to do that like oh yeah, it takes four frames or something I, I, that's, what like, I, that's what i grew up but i had a beta and i had to like pause pause yeah pause, right pause. <laughs> which is like uh, you know you know it's not ideal yeah but i could do it actually on super 8 film um and i i just started going way too uh, uh adventurous right off the bat and started like animating these full figures sort of illustrative mm -hmm. type style things to see what you know what it would be like i mean um i almost kind of went too far all at once and the animation kind of turned out a little bit stiff and you know because i wasn't doing a lot of the sort of flexible organic things that you that you need to do when you're animating i was basically sort of moving illustrations around and this is all before like you got to college even right? yeah 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 so yeah. You, I'm just, you know, kind of feel I'm hearing, but you instinctively knew you had to study motion, you had to study drawing, and yeah. it's just like it, it. It seems like a natural course for you just to become this animator, right? I guess so. Look back yeah. on it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think I think it probably was. I was just, um, I've always been interested in, uh, although it's only something I've I've re recently sort of come to terms with. Like, oh yeah, I guess I do think like that. I've always been. Um, I've always found beauty in movement or, or a kinetic thrill uh, to things that move, especially people doing things that they're really good at, mm -hmm. you know, with their bodies. And I've always been interested in that in, since I was a child. You know, my, my mother to told me that, that she took me to the Royal Ballet when I was six and I stood on the chair watching Jeremy Fisher and just like hmm. completely hypnotized. No, that's awesome. I mean, I feel very fortunate that I found animation and filmmaking as a career. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but it seems like you became what you were destined to become in a, in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know. Maybe. Right. maybe. I mean, but, I, I, certain, can you certain, imagine doing anything else? I guess, well, I guess certainly there was, I was very fortunate in that there was a discipline which matched what my brain likes to do. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I, I was super lucky because I was like wandering the desert. Like, what am I going to do with my life? And then I found animation. I was like, oh, my God, I could do this forever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I did that. And then I went to college. Um, well, first I did this foundation course in art at Cambridge Tech uh, where they actually had a Super 8 camera on an Oxbury rostrum. Um, and they let me use that for a semester or two. And I started doing like cutouts. And, and other types mm -hmm. of animation, which were a lot quicker and helped me learn timing a lot better, uh, faster. You know, I was, I was into Terry Gilliam's yeah. Monty Python work and I would do cutouts underneath the camera and stuff like that, which was a really good way to learn timing really fast. That's awesome. Um, does your family understand like who you are, like what you do and, and like you're one of the greatest animators that is animating in the world today? Yeah, we, we don't talk about that around the dinner table. <laughs> but I, I think, yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think my mom and dad are very proud of me, for sure. But um, they're all, they are, I have a lot of artistry in the family. Yeah. You know, I've said before that they are, you know, I basically come from a family of scientists and engineers. But they are now all on the arts side of things, you know, since huh. they either retired or have changed jobs or changed their lives and you know, my sister started out as a microbiologist and, and, and worked on diseases and stuff like that. And she now designs, uh, she does sculpture, she uh -huh. designs dolls, fabrics. She lives in the north of Scotland and she <laughs> is an artist now. Wow, wow. I wonder if you, uh, you kind of showed them like there is actually a career in art. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, I think my family was always had a creative side to them, but before me, it was a hobby. You know, and I think I was like the first one to make it a vocation. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, we talked, uh, it's funny, I went back and listened to our interview and we talked about acting and I felt like, you know, just listening to you talk and uh, just hearing you over the years, it feels like you have all this information that, that you want to get out. You know, like, like you, you've been collecting this stuff and you've done lectures and um, it just feels like you're like, Oh, here's an opportunity to like, you know, tell you more because I feel like it's all like rattling around in your head, like wanting to come out. It's just this perception I have of you. And um, do you feel like uh, communication is like a huge kind of thing you have to do? Obviously, well, talking about animation, animating is communicating. It seems like that's, that's a I huge part have, of who yeah. you are. Yeah, I do have a lot of stuff rattling around. 
in my head actually about like what I want to say about animation. And I want to do, um, I mean, ultimately I want to do like a, a video series or something where yeah. I like do a really good version of everything that's in my head. Um, I don't know what it would be 16 hours or whatever it would be. Yeah. yeah. Just like my ultimate, like, and I want to do it on video because I don't think books do it, do animation justice. Right. You gotta see, I have, to, I have to see it move. You know, I like things that move. So I, I need to do it on video, not really as a book, but um, yeah, I would, I would love to make my, like an ultimate animation documentary, like, you know, yeah, no, like, it would be like, Carl, like Carl Sagan's Cosmos, but for animation. And have you felt that um, does doing talks and lectures, does it make you understand it better? Or is it just a, a more a matter of just organizing the info to communicate it to someone else? Oh yeah, no, it totally makes me understand it better. And, and, and I, and I end up, revising what I think about things because of the act of trying to explain it because sometimes the act of trying to explain it makes you actually think about it harder and maybe research a bit better to to actually uh you know make sure that you are saying what's actually true yeah. about something yeah you know, because sometimes we get stuff locked in our heads which is just like no actually that's not true and you have to kind of go back and re-examine it and and stuff like that you know talking about like quadruped walks and stuff like that for many years. I constantly have to go back and revise like what I say mm -hmm. about them because I learn something new or something extra or like, yeah, but that's not a hard and fast rule. They do, they do different stuff too, you know? Yeah. So yeah. The act of teaching actually really does help you get to the, to the truth a bit better. Yeah. And it, I mean, for me too, it's, you know, you, you find an example or you have to find an example to illustrate what you're trying to talk about. And you're like, I don't know where it is. And you can find like, Oh, there's the piece that's going to unlock that for someone else. Yeah. Um, have you over the years, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Cause like I've, you know, when I was at Disney, like we could go to the ARL, we could watch your lectures. You know, I, I've watched your talk about, you know, Shere Khan and or Ka in the jungle book. Right. And, uh, I learned a whole lot from that. And, over the years, a lot of what you've talked about has really influenced how I look at animation. Um, basically, I, I think you've never been wrong. <laughs> um, but <laughs> are there are there things that you used to believe that now you're like, actually, no, I don't, I don't approach it that way anymore. Anything you can think of that you've you've changed your um, your approach over the years? Yeah, I find out things all the time. I mean, when I first started, like going back to the quadruped thing, when I first started doing quadrupeds. Just, I thought that, you know, because I'd read it in books that dogs and cats do a rotary gallop and horses and, you know, other big herbivores do a transverse gallop, you know, the order of the footfalls going across instead of around in a circle. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and after like, just thinking that for a year or two, like found out, no, actually dogs and cats do a transverse gallop too. They're fine with it. They just have this extra gear, which they go to, you know, yeah. when they're going top speed, right? So I'm constantly finding out things like that. I had Belle's walk in my head. The timing of her walk was like this weird thing, which is too uh, constrained where I tried to have her feet on the, both feet on the ground for almost the same time as one of them was off the ground to give her this ballet thing, but it was too restrictive. And I think it actually made some of the walks I did on her like, too much of like her foot stuck to the ground and then <laughs> whipping that foot across, <laughs> trying to get that ballet thing. But the, the formula, formula that I came up with to do it, you know, I wouldn't do it like that anymore. I'd, I'd be more subtle and, and, you know, better at that stuff. I think I've said before, that's the one film I would want to go back and redo. Right, right. Well, I mean, uh, I've, I've seen all the shots you did on that film, pencil tests and everything. Uh, some, of them are, some of them are good. So I, I'm, I'm quite proud of some of them. But just the act of making that movie, mm -hmm. I would want to do over. Um, you know, it's funny because I, I don't mean to compare myself to you because it's not even close. I, if you're a, a hundred, I'm like a sixty on the scale. But uh, you know, I, I have you know supervised and directed, and and you at a very young age you talked about this, and and after being in the beach, you kind of took a break because it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Have you found that? Um, you've just you kind of came out as this great animator from the beginning and have you found that it's been difficult to kind of have friendships in studios because of that because you've been a supervisor or um i don't think so i mean i'm not like the super social person anyway you know mm -hmm. taking the office by the back stairs um but but no i don't think i found, I found that 
you know, I've tried to, you know, you go through phases in your life where you're like either very ambitious or you're, 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 uh, but I think I've sort of started to, you know, as you mature, you know, you reach a, you reach a point where, where you kind of go, yeah, well, man, we're just making a cartoon. It's not, (laughs) (laughs) it's not a huge deal. I don't, yeah. Yeah, I I guess I'm looking at that from like my perspective. Like, I think I'm only like six years younger than you. You're, but like when I got there, it was like, oh my God, it's James Baxter. And it's like, could we go knock on his, we were so scared to even knock on your door. And it's like, you're just a guy in the end. Yeah, just a guy. Although I, I think I've also said this before. It is, if you're going to have any degree of notoriety or even fame, if you want to call it that, um, doing it like at the level that I have that is probably the best way to do it. In that, in that I am, you know, I am famous in extremely small parts of the world, like the halls of Cal Arts. Right. But nowhere else. Right, right. So you can decide when you want to be famous. <laughs> I think being legitimately famous would be just horrible just horrible but having just a little bit for it of it if you if you felt like your ego needed a stroke you could actually like yeah like yeah go somewhere where people would like you know you know see you and yeah that's oh my gosh how nice is that right yeah and i think the interesting thing about like what you do as an animator what anyone does like you're famous specifically because of the work right like the things yeah, you put on the screen are the thing, you know, um, you, you don't have to, you know, show up in a Ferrari and, <laughs> you know. That's actually, that's a really important point. And it's something that, that uh, is good to kind of pass on is that I always tried, I saw very early um, a couple of artists that were more talk than work. And they were like talking themselves up, I don't know, out of insecurity or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And it, I found it very off putting. And I, I, very early on, I said, I, I, I'm just going to let the work speak for itself. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in there asking for a raise because I think I'm great. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm just going to really try and kill it on the work and and let that carry me through. Um, it's, so, it's such a better place to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> than the other way around. Yeah, from this side too, it's a much better thing to see. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, well, speaking of work, you know, and and people that as they get you know on in their career, and this is not you I'm talking about, but you know, we've seen people who diminish as they get older. It's just, it's, it's, for some people, it's just a fact of life. For a lot of most people, it, it is what happens. You know, um, I don't want to bash Chuck Jones in front of 100 people, but like you know, he, he started drawing eyelashes and everything, and it, he became very a stylized version of himself. Mm-hmm. You know, um, how do you do? You have to kind of like force yourself to keep getting better like for example like I worked with Glenn on Tangled and I watched him get better over the course of that movie and he was you know pushing 60 years old at the time Um, and I was just really really inspired by like how he just never like backs off you know and do you try to keep finding ways to refresh yourself and yeah I think um have doing a diversity of work finding different kinds of projects I think has helped me in in that um in trying not to become stale or, or mannered or like you say, sort of a caricature of your own work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Chuck, God bless him, lo- loved everything he did, but you know, I know what you're talking about. And I think because he, he did this singular thing, you can see it in Peanuts too, as, as Schultz gets you know, older, you know, the work evolves and becomes a more mannered version of itself. The line changes as he gets older and stuff like yeah. that. It's because he's doing this one thing forever and ever and ever. Right. And he's not doing other things, right? Right. Give him other input, give him other stuff. And, and what I found really you know, nice about my career is I've got a chance, to, especially now at Netflix, got a chance to work on so many weird, different things. I can't have like a you know, house style or a James Baxter style. I can't afford to like, you know, in, impose a singular style on the things that I do. I, animation so collaborative you have to kind of adapt and change yourself to what you're working on and, and I think that's helped a lot in you know stopping myself so far at least having you know getting into that sort of caricature of yourself yeah yeah and then you know obviously I've, I've watched your career and I think the Netflix thing is is really cool because like I've seen you know I, I came and visited you there and we saw you know probably a fraction of what's being done there but there are what like 12 features in development at any point 
-hmm. and there's how many series like maybe 20 30 yeah yeah i mean in actually in the netflix animation studio there's about 35 different projects going through at any one time um you know slightly more series than film um but yeah that's that's kind of about it um and, and you don't necessarily touch every one of them, right? But no, no, not every one of them. But you know, I'm aware of them all. <laughs> I have to be aware of them all. You know, my job is the, sort of this artistic support role for everybody that's at the studio in terms of character animation. And, and so are, are you role. able to kind of describe, you know, a day or a week? Or like, what do you do? <laughs> do now. Um, well, right off the bat, I. Well, maybe I'll save this, but right off the bat, I always little, carve out a little time where I actually get to animate something. Because if yeah. I didn't get to animate anything, I'd just get sad. So I do, I, and I've always done this. Even when I supervise animation on movies, I'll always carve out time. And, you know, sometimes it makes the production mad because, you know, I have to animate something, you know, because that's what I do. I'm an animator, yeah. right? Um, so that being said, um, I, I, I do two basically two big things. I work inside of Netflix Animation Studio with all the creators that come in, uh, talking about how they want their film to look, what kind of technique they want it to be in. I will consult on character design. I'll organize or sometimes even do uh, pre-production tests for them. Uh, uh, we'll organize stuff in CG or with 2D. Uh, I work with our look development team when they're trying to come up with some crazy new look that, that somebody wants to do for a movie. Uh, so yeah, that's what I kind of do inside the studio, sort of help uh, a production get up on its feet as far as character animation goes, mm -hmm. like early performance tests, organizing that kind of stuff, right? And sometimes doing some of it too, expression sheets, draw overs, stuff like that, um, before a film really gets into production. Uh, then in production, uh, I work, and I've got a couple of folks that work with me, uh, Christophe Saran and uh, Rune Beneke. Rune's in Montreal, Christophe's in Paris. And we help actually up level the talent at all of the partner studios that we work with. Cause right now Netflix does all of its shot production at studios that we partner with. Yeah. Sony image works, uh, cartoon saloon folks all over the world. Right. So we actually go to these places. We do master classes. you know, we're not there to approve individual shots or, or whatever, but we're there to kind of up level uh, animation crews skills, um, to really kind of like, help them do the best work that they can and also, have, and also help Netflix get the um, amount of work done that we need to get done. Man, that is so awesome. You and Chris and, and Rune. And Rune yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. And do you guys, um, I mean, are you, are you guys like the three, I don't know, what's your, what's your title? What, what I'm director of character animation for Netflix. Um, yeah. Right now, uh, those guys are kind of uh, they're called animation consultants and, uh -huh. and inside the studio we're actually building out the team and getting some animation specialists in, in there as well but uh, wow. you know that kind of that's very cool uh, and you know it's funny too because you know for a couple of years it was like what's happening with animation is 2d going to go away and all the stuff and now netflix is really doing something on yeah we've got we got some uh, hand-drawn films happening uh the stuff at cartoon saloon we're doing um sergio Pablos uh, in Madrid. Um, yeah, so there's this. Um, Titmouse is working on hand drawn stuff with us, um, you know, features as well as, as series. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of hand drawn stuff in series, but yeah, there's at least four hand drawn features, I think, going on right now. That's awesome. Um, and I'm glad to know that you make time to animate. Um, it's funny because if you didn't, it would just be like, well, what's he doing? Like, <laughs> you know, um, have you ever been approached to direct a project or is that just something you yeah, just don't care once about? twice. And, and I, I, I always felt like I, if I needed to do that, it had to be something that was meant a lot to me personally, mm -hmm. um, to go down the directing route. I may or may not do that in the future, but, um, yeah, it's not off the, off the, table for sure yeah yeah because you know I, I hear you talk about when you supervise you supervise you do your best to help people create their best work right like that's i think a very healthy approach versus right. do it this way and you try to force people to do it the way you would do it which is yeah, possible, yeah. Right? The, the art of supervising is something that i learned yeah over the years probably slower than actually learning how to animate <laughs> Because I, I can imagine, like, if uh, my vision of James directing is like, well, you would want to animate. You wouldn't want to just direct. You well, I probably would. I probably would. I would probably be like, like one of the first uh, 
animation directors are actually animated on their own film, you know, like, you know, you go out Richard. Like, like a live action actor sometimes does that when they direct a movie, right? Um, you know, I, I know that obviously Miyazaki, even though he maybe didn't animate, he basically would board his entire movies. Yeah. You know, so uh, I feel like if I did direct a movie, I, again, I would just make everyone mad and uh, insist that I had to animate some stuff on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I apologize for jumping all over the place, but I feel like I'm just kind of like filling in the blanks this is good. This is good. questions I wanted to know. So like when you did Kung Fu Panda, the intro yeah. of that, that's, that was, uh, it was kind of an invented style. You know, I mean, you took existing, you know, After Effects and limited animation, mixed it with, you know, detailed animation that felt full. Um, did you know going in how you would do it? Or was that something that you found along the way? When we did Enchanted, it was my first exposure to After Effects because that was the end part of the pipeline. We composited everything in After Effects. And I had two uh, compositors uh, at the studio, uh, Jason Brubaker and Eric Tillmans. And um, so I could see what they were up to and, and was really interested in just like, oh, what can, what can this program do? That's cool. You, you know, we were putting in like two and a half D ground planes and, and like creating, after, you know, sort of um, multi-plane type stuff you know for enchanted in there uh yeah and they, they had shown me yeah you can like mesh warp things <clears throat> and you can put like little puppet pins into artwork and kind of move them around uh so oh, that's interesting so actually when kung fu panda came along um i was actually kind of primed to try something like that um so yeah uh, we talked about the style for kung fu panda we initially, I, I was talking with John Stevenson and, and, and Mark Osborne um, about the style that they wanted. Um, and we talked a, a little bit about the anime uh, side of it. If we wanted to go down the anime road, it didn't seem right because it, well, for one thing, it, it was you know, Chinese, not Japanese, which I guess you most closely associate with anime. Um, uh, so we wanted to do it on ones. So it didn't, you know, it, it had that different feeling there, but we also wanted to make it very, uh, graphic and, and stylist, stylistic and, and really match what <clears throat> what the art directors were doing in terms of the artwork that they had prepared for that mm -hmm. for that opening scene like no we really wanted to look just like this okay pixel for pixel if you can manage it you know so what ramon zivak and tang hang and the, their group of painters were doing um we really just like no we we're going to match that exactly and see how far we can get with it. So it seemed like After Effects was a good way to do it. So yeah, it was a combination of, of doing sequential animation, you know, hand-drawn, pencil, cleanup, uh, gets put, get, got inked and painted, uh, and had like textures and stuff mapped onto it, you know, textures pumped through yeah. color, color shapes, and morphing it in and out of that into After Effects uh, and then doing a lot of the digital in-betweening and slowing into pose, mm -hmm. slowing out of them in After Effects. Awesome. So I, because I got to animate the whole thing, I was, I was basically animating the whole, whatever it was, four minutes or mm -hmm. whatever it was. I could just plan that stuff out myself. I didn't have to communicate how this was done to anybody. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was just, and because, you know, I'm a, an animator that likes to plan things, um, I would actually just think about a scene I would draw the bits that I knew I need, had to draw because I couldn't manipulate them in After Effects. But I knew down the road what my slow ins and slow outs were going to be and mm -hmm. the trickery I could pull off with the mesh warping and, and stuff later. So it was all like this weird planning, you know, throwing, and it didn't look any good until that you were done. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But I did, I did, I did like, I animated flag waving, I'd animated water splashes, I did all sorts of weird stuff on that that we used all over the place. That's so cool. Um, and <laughs> do you find, like, when you're doing the Netflix stuff, um, I'm just imagining there's so many different projects, right? And um, are there some that, like, don't know how they're going to be made? And do you kind of step in, like, well, you could do this or you could do that? Or um, is it, are pipelines pretty straightforward these days? Um, it's a bit of both. It's mm -hmm. a bit of both. So some things, obviously, they come and, and like aesthetics or pipeline on something is, is something that the project already has established in their head and they don't want to break any new ground per se. They, they know that they, they want to do a CG thing, but they're not interested in being like super adventurous in terms of style. That's their thing. It might be like a kid series or something. They go, no, it's just, just like a, a mid-range CG 
you know, there's, and there's not too much to talk about other than making sure that the partner studio has a good pipeline and they've got yeah. good people and they can pull it off, right? <clears throat> uh, but other things are just like, yeah, we want to try and figure out how sort of painterly or illustrative or, you know, what's our best way to do that? And um, so I'm, I'm one of a few people at the studio who can kind of guide them, especially new filmmakers, because we do have a lot of first time directors, mm -hmm. you know, at the studio who have never been through this process. So it's good for them to have folks like me who've done a lot of movies. Yeah. Who can kind of like say what, what's probably a good idea and what's going to be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to advise them in that way. Um, yeah. It's interesting, you know, just to hear you've done cut out animation, hand drawn, CG. Yeah. The only thing I haven't really done is stop motion. I mean, I did a tiny bit of stop motion in college. Uh huh. Um, and it was, no, it wasn't really, it was claymation more than stop motion. It yeah. More, more than actually rig puppets. Uh, but I do talk with a lot of the stop motion actors, you know, up in uh, Portland, you know, yeah. we, uh, we talk all the time, um, more just about performance and animation. So, I mean, cause it's all animation, right? Yeah. Even though your technique is different. I don't think my lower back could handle doing a uh, stop motion <laughs> um, anymore. I think that ship has sailed. <laughs> and this, this kind of leads into acting because, you know, you could be the greatest drawer artist you could know how to move things but that that's not performance that's not mm -hmm. connecting with the character and the, the feeling of all that um even you know i watched your uh, you did this cool little video for netflix of how to you know do a flip book and a ball bounce like your ball bounce had character and it was like watching you draw it i was like okay he's doing like very rational kind of scientific parabolas and spacing and but then you played it and it had character and i was just like damn it <laughs> and i made this my agenda for this meeting where is this uh i don't have this piece of paper around anymore oh i don't know where it is but it basically said destroy james baxter <laughs> because uh i was like man is even a bouncing ball that you've done has this feeling behind it and um you know let's can we talk about acting can yeah love to i just um, did a, like a two-hour master class on performance for animal logic who are down in sydney and uh yeah so yeah wow. it's kind, of, kind of at the top of my mind oh, awesome then you have more content than we have time for um yeah. well, well one of my first and again this kind of goes to the people that are watching this is okay so i'm kind of in the same boat like i tried acting classes i'm a horrible actor i cannot get in front of people and get out of my own head to become a character performance wise right I can do it. I can. I know how to board it. I know how to animate it. I can do it on paper or on a screen, but I can't do it in front of people, right? So how, and I don't know if I have the answer to this, but maybe you do. How can a person become a good actor without acting? That's really interesting. Obviously, animators are different than live action actors. We're slightly different animals. You know, Chuck Jones yeah. said, you know, an animator is an actor with a pencil. Huh? Yeah, kind of. But, you know, so is an actual actor holding a pencil. So <laughs> <laughs> they, they, we do things which are, are essentially different. And the big difference is obviously that we don't do it with our own bodies. We are not cast because of our physicality. You know, we are, I've been mermaids and horses and mice and all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, but as a live action actor, you are cast because of your physicality as well as your acting talent and everything like that. So the big difference is we're not doing it with our own bodies. And that's something I actually say to animators who are shooting a lot of reference of themselves to be cautious because that's your body and it's not the body of the character. And there's all sorts of transposition you're going to have to do to make it right, to, to turn it into the character and think about that. Um, so that's one thing. We don't do it with our own bodies and we don't do it in real time. Mm -hmm. No, we don't do it in real time. But the thing you have to be able to do, obviously as, a, 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 as an animator, we work in m very varied styles of performance from very simplistic, basic, jumping around, pointing at a cereal box, you know, in a commercial, which is kind of like being a circus clown. Mm. It's not like acting from in here, right? That part of animation. It's very much sort of an outside in uh, approach to animation where you're thinking about what you're gonna do and then you, you plan it and you do it and it's made up of these poses which communicate things. Yeah. But they are sort of things that you are experienced in pulling off because you know they communicate those things. Uh, and, it's, and it's one sort of end of the scale. And it actually equates a little bit more to act, 
what a live action actor tends to do when they're doing more comedy, you know, when they're not actually having to dig quite as deep emotionally, but they're having to be very experienced about how you communicate through poses and, right. you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, which, which is a talent, but it's a different... Yeah, it's a different kind of talent. It's more like being a circus clown than it is a movie actor, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what you have, what you have to do. Right, but animation has this sort of sliding scale where you can do that kind of stuff. You you might be working in limited animation on television. Uh, you might be doing something very cartoony and silly, uh, and and there's this sort of scale where it gets more serious and dramatic, all the way up to like this much more realistic, emotional, truthful moments that you're going to have to animate at some point. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you get to do one of those one day. Um, they don't come along that often, but in order to do that stuff, even if you're not doing it with your own body, like a real actor does, you have to be able, at least be able to understand the process that they go through in their heads to prepare to do that. Because I find myself, I very rarely shoot live action to do something, mm -hmm. but sometimes I do, but, but very rarely. But I find myself trying to do the process sort of half in my head sitting in my chair where I'm actually trying to do much closer to what a real actor does um, when they're trying to um, do that thing where they're, where they're doing it from the gut. Now, you could talk about Stanislavski and, and Stella Adler and Sanford Meisner and all these great acting teachers that talk about how to get yourself into that place, mm -hmm. the techniques that and actors use to get themselves into the right emotional place to let the action happen to them without actually planning what they're gonna do. Because that's the real difference between what you might call clowning or classical acting. You know, when you're preparing what you can do, I'm proud, so I'm gonna stick out my chest. And what you would call method or anything, or any of the offshoots from what you would call method acting. Um, you know, only really you can sort of call like Stanislavski or, or, or Lee Strasberg sort of real sort of method acting. Right where you're trying to like use your own sense memories and stuff and, you know, <laughs> Stella yeah. Adler or Sanford Meisner are much more about like, no, you're creating an imaginary world. You're I just did a, a quick talk on Stella Adler. Oh, That's cool. Funny. Awesome. So yeah. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Sandy Meisner who says acting is behaving truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Yeah. So you're trying to create this imaginary world for you to behave in rather than you're planning it out. Right. Um, so it's that process of a, an animator sitting in their chair, getting themselves into the right place, knowing the story, knowing the character really well and how they are different from you and how they do things with their bodies, which is different from you, how they hold themselves in a default position, which is different than yours. Do, do, are they neurotic? Do they operate from up in here, which makes them do this? Are they, um, you know, relaxed or a libertine and they operate from down in here and it makes them wobble around like this. Mm -hmm. How, what are the things about them as a person that makes their bodies do certain things um, or operate in certain ways? You know that stuff, you've got that down. And, in, and it's a process of putting yourself in that right emotional space and just like knowing the story and, and, and kind of go, get it all out and get yourself free and then just letting it happen to you. Mm -hmm. rather than thinking about what you're going to do. So it is technically method acting because uh, you're putting yourself in an emotional state. Yeah. 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 I mean, method you're actually, not, you don't have to like shed tears, right? Yeah, me method actually implies that you stay in that state. Even when you're done. When, <laughs> after, after the director yells cut. Yeah. yeah you know, that's, why, actor, that's why I actually like Stella Adler because she's like, you don't have to go that no, far. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman staying up for three days straight to shoot yeah. an Amazon man. Uh, because he was doing a scene where he had to look like he was being tortured and Laurence Olivier saying, my dear boy, why don't you try acting? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's the yeah. difference. Um, you, I'm going to, you have so much, I don't want to interrupt this because I, I feel like yeah. I did that on our last interview. I was like, let me ask these questions, but I have along the way. So you talk about Stella Adler and Strasberg and Sen did you just read those books or did you watch? You know, watching stuff is really great. Inside the Actor's Studio is awesome. You know, James Lipton is a nut, but just mm -hmm. watching those shows about actors talking about how they do it mm -hmm. is so good. You know, you can get so much out of like how they think about what they're doing. Right. 
And I think, you know, being an animator, you, you have to watch those things and be like, oh, that works for me because not everything does because it's such right. a different approach. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, what I was saying before is like getting into that space where you, where you're, you're not thinking about exactly what you're going to do. You let it happen to your body or at least the body that's in your imagination, mm -hmm. you know, your, your animated character's body, you let it happen to them, but almost instantaneously as an animator, you've got to do something very different than, a, than an actor. An actor can just free themselves up and do it and kind of forget about it after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just get it out and they're, actors, they're past it, yeah. Actors behave and animators describe, basically. Mm -hmm. As an animator, you then have to spend the next week describing what it is that you did in your head. Right, I was gonna ask you that. So the first thing you have to know is the feeling, right? And then yeah. like, as you're, as you're like hitting on that feeling of like, oh, that's what the character should feel like, or that's how they should respond. Do you start instantly thinking the image of that is this? Yeah, so very instantly, there's like a duality in your head which has to go on where you're freeing yourself up enough to do something honest and truthful and from in here, but almost instantaneously question in the back of your head, what was that? Exactly. What did I do? I mean, exactly what did I do physically? Mm -hmm. Did I, did my, what happened to my chest? What happened to my head? What, how fast was that head shake that I just did? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, it, and very, very fast. I have to kind of like start yeah. doing little scribbles, actually making, my thumbnails are terrible because they're, they're just like, literally like circles and dots with like eye direction or, or head angle or body posture and often notes because the drawings are so quick. It's like, looks yeah. up here, glance back on, and then I'll put this word, and then, you know, I'll make little notes about it if I'm trying to do a long scene of acting. Yeah. Like yeah. that. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, so you, uh, you're, you're drawing, but like, as you're feeling, and it's, it's practice, the more you do it, the more you know what your head shake felt like. So you can kind of like draw head shake and you'll know, you'll know how to recall that, right? Sure. Yeah. It's and I, like you're saying, like, that's the trap of, I think, video reference. Like I, I've shot a lot of myself, but it's like you, you become a slave to it mm -hmm. and it stops being one, like you said, it's yourself too much. Like I, every, every reference I have, these big hands are flopping around. <laughs> like I can't stop that. You know, it's just what I'm built like. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have to like fight that. And I think what your approach is, uh, it's, it's the smartest approach, honestly, because it's like you've taken all this. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's things you can find out of video reference, which you might not think about in your imagination. There's certain weight shift things or body pose things, which you go like, I don't think I would have drawn or posed that exactly that way had I not shot it and like seen someone do it. But of course the trick is to kind of do this transposition where you are take, just taking that idea and, and going, oh, that was an interesting tilt of the head. I'm going to try putting that into the character, making sure it fits in with the kind of character holds their bodies rather than you do. Mm -hmm. And then making adjustments for weight, for size, for, you know, things like that. I mean, if it's a very heavy character or it's a very tiny character, if you're animating a little, I mean, you've animated a hamster, you know, they, they accelerate really fast. You know, they get up to full speed in like three frames. Yeah you know, yeah. which, which you don't do. So right. you have to make those trans transpositions. Yeah. They're built right. like a little spring. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so uh, there's uh, friendly, there's little details that I want to know about James. So, uh, you are very, like I watch your animation and the thing that really, two things really jump out to me. Like, you know, kind of when to catch the audience's attention, you know, like what's going to be a showy, like a eye opening or an expression. So as you're acting and you're putting your notes down, you're, you're, you're asking yourself, like, what's the best version of this, you know, on this 2d plane, right? Like how, how is that going to work? Yeah. There's like the, what's the character going to do is my first consideration. Like just what are they going to do? <laughs> and then close on the heels of that. How do I make that clear? you know, basically in that order. And what they're going to do. Like clarity yeah. supersedes, uh, I don't know, entertainment or showiness or, or um, are they the same? It certainly supersedes showiness. I think clarity is part of entertainment. It's like the foundation for entertainment. Yeah. If, if you can't communicate, uh, that, that's what I say to animators, like, you know, when they say, what's the most important thing? And I'll say clarity, communication. Yeah. It's the only thing you can really fail at. Yeah as an animator, everything else is basically up for grabs. Yeah, you know, you can I, I, be super limited. You can be intentionally grotesque. 
you can be, you know, you can draw something in the, this, this really like bizarre style or, or like, you know, the art direction, you know, how appealing, appealing. I don't even know what that means anymore. Um, <laughs> something is. Well, it's um, funny because I actually think that I <laughs> feel like appeal is clarity. Yeah, maybe that's true. But the one thing that if you get wrong, in other words, communicating what you intend to communicate, that's the only way to really fail. Yeah. Yeah, everything else, you know, the, the mechanics, the polish, you know, it's all, it's all extra, it's all up for grabs. But yeah. obviously your technique can help you communicate things clearly, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, that, it's the most important thing for me. And another thing, just in terms of acting, that I want to ask you about, the, the other aspect that I see so much in your work that brings your characters to life is those thinking moments, those, those mind changes or the realizations or the thoughts before they go do something. Like, how do you have a, um, a way of thinking about that or an approach to like, how do you keep your characters alive and thinking and processing? I just, and, I just try and remind myself that this is the first time this has happened to them. You know, it's, it's, it's not like, uh, and I was kind of like, um, feel like, have you seen Kyle Mooney on Saturday Night Live? No. Okay, so he's this, you know, he's been on the show for about a, a year or two now. And he's such an expert at doing this high school acting, like the you know, intentionally bad high school acting where the person is completely prepared for what they're going to say and they kind of drone it out in this monotone kind of thing, right? Yeah. And, and that's what I'm trying not to do. I'm trying to imagine that this is the first time this character has, has experienced this thing. And there's all sorts of crazy stuff that happens in your face. And part of this is like this actory, getting yourself in the right moment, seeing what happens to your body when it feels real to you. But there is a part of it which you go like, oh, I've noticed what actors do when they, when they realize something because it's all a trick for them too. Yeah. They know what they're gonna say. They've oh, learned yeah. the script. This is not actually improvised. They have to make it look like it is. So there are actually things that they do, you know, and, and I've got to actually uh, like, Kind of, if there's any animation editors or story artists uh, listening right now, make give you give your characters a little bit of space to think before they speak. It makes all the difference when you animate it. Not all the time, but you know, enough that you that they, the animator has a few frames for the for the thought to happen on the face before the words come out of the mouth. Yeah, you want you want to talk about like how that mind body connection works? Yeah, I mean. The, the, best, the best clip to watch for this is the opening of Amadeus, where, where old Salieri is talking to the priest and their conversation in that, because you can see the thoughts going over Salieri's face when the priest will say something, you know, when, when the priest will say, like, offer me your confession, like, all men are equal in God's eyes. And Salieri does this thing where he, he, you see this thought going like, oh, here's some ammunition. I'm going to have fun with this guy. Hmm. And it's all just in a few frames before he actually says something. And then he takes his wheelchair and he turns it around. And then you get this slight smile halfway through the preparation where, you, where you, he realizes what he's going to say. And he does this nice big wind up and he goes, are they? You know. Um, but it's having, uh, you know, I think it's just having a recognition that there are, uh, that there are thoughts that, that arise in your head and, and you can't make yourself think of things just as much as you can't stop yourself from thinking something. Consciousness arises. It's an emergent property. Thoughts appear in your mind. They rise in your mind unbidden. You, you can't control them. Mm -hmm. They do things to your face when, yeah. when, they, when they happen. You know, it, you have a tell on your face. And it, it might be just your eyes kind of looking off to the side as you like, you know, are searching for an idea. It might be your eyes, you know, casting down and your eyebrows twitching as you are like, oh, that's a, I shouldn't say that. I'm trying to not reveal that. There's all sorts of ways that your face does micro expressions and stuff. There's a big literature about it. Um, but it often happens before you start to speak, before you actually say what, you know, the thing that you, you want to actually present to the world about what's happening in your head. Right. And, which, and sometimes the opposite, which is actually sometimes the opposite of what's really happening inside your head. Exactly. Which is the subtext. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that process is subconscious where you don't know you're making a face and yeah. other times yeah. you are, you know, 
deciding to yourself, do I want to reveal this thought or not? I, w- I would recommend to all animators to literally frame through a movie that you think has good acting and look at all the moments or look at all the things that happen to an actor's face before they start to speak and when they're listening to another character, you know, when they are reacting to another character. Have you um, found that like you'll be animating a shot and you need that time, you don't have, it's been mm-hmm. cut out and you have to go back and get it? Um, rarely, but yeah, you can usually find a place for it. If, if, it's, if it's cut well and, and, if, and it feels right in terms of the rhythm of the voices, if they're not just completely on top of each other in a moment, which is not arguing and actually characters have to think, you know, um, then uh, yeah, occasionally I'll, you know, that's usually the place we need to open up a little bit. Yeah. Hopefully you're working on a, on a, on a show or, or a film which allows that kind of flexibility and you're not so much under the gun. You just have to like, no, sorry, do it. Yeah. You've got, you got 54 frames, no more. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I feel like I cut you off in terms of the acting conversation, but like, what else? What else would you like to talk about? And the other weird thing about animators is we don't do the voice, right? We have right. no control over that performance. I did it we... once, but yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Again, how do you voice. how do you wrap your head around, or how do you help someone wrap their head around? Like, it's not me. Hey, Bobby's going to stop us pretty soon. Oh no. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. I think, no well, but, obviously, there's this. Please. Obviously, there's this sort of karaoke thing that an animator has to do where yeah. they're sort of acting to another sound, right? But actors kind of almost have to do that too. They're acting to a script. We're yeah. all basically doing the same kind of thing. We just have a bit of an extra layer on top of that often. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, man, amazing James Clay. Uh, I just wanted to respect everyone's time and, and not keep keep you guys uh, like too long. Yeah, we should do some uh, Q&A. Yeah, I want to get some Q&A. So, so yeah, I, got, I got lots of my cues in, so I'm happy. <laughs> Sarai, um, are you there? Can you hear us? Um, oh, did she bounce? Um, Maybe she's muted. Sarai, what do you think? Oh, OK. Um, OK, so let's see. I'm gonna invite her again, just cause I want her to be on. <laughs> oh no, is she going? Um, okay, um, so the next question we have is uh, from the Discord, uh, Queen of Centaur Karania, are you here? You, you took my uh, username. Hold on, sorry, oh jeez. Yeah, it looks yeah, like yeah. it's Trisha. It says, yep, that's me. Trisha Evans dash. Is it? I don't want to mispronounce. Oh, Wait, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. 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 cool, cool. Uh, how can I promote her? Let's see. The intro voice is here to support you both. I mean, all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Well, while you're doing that, should Clay ask one more question? Bobby? Yes. Oh, wait, you got it. We got, her. Her. We got okay. Trisha. We got okay, Trisha. Hi. Hi, Trisha. Hello. Hello. Hi, Trisha. <laughs> you're good. Oh, my God. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Trisha. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, so, um, firstly, thank you for letting me on to this webinar. It's just so inspiring. Just like, seeing like all of like my animation heroes like you know in like one setting i mean for me also i think the fact that you know um um james you're british and that makes me happy because i'm british and i'm like oh my gosh someone actually made it that's from the uk you know (laughs) like you know it gives me hope that you know i'll i'll get there soon so i guess my question for you is um when you are, and I think you kind of answered this already before, but just to elaborate, when you are, you know, given a shot to animate and they say, okay, this is the shot we want you to animate, like immediately, like what's the first thing you you do? Do you like start writing notes or do you immediately just start like sketching ideas? Does your brain sort of uh, formulate a plan on how you're going to like spaced out each part of like the shot you're going to animate 
what's the I mean, first I, thing you immediately think of doing? The first thing I immediately think of doing is, is, is like, what's the story? What's the part of the story I'm trying to tell? Before I think about what the character is going to do, I, I always take a, a few moments or, you know, even more than a few moments and, and think about like, what's important about this? There's, there's kind of a thing that young animators do, which I was incredibly guilty of too, which is being a bit like a new puppy uh, uh, when you get a shot and you want to throw everything into it and you kind of go like, ah, just, you know, uh, and that ability to take a step back and go like, what story point am I really trying to communicate here? And that might be really simple or it, you know, whatever that takes to communicate that idea That's the first thing I do. And once I've got that sort of framework, I can start making better choices that have better taste, if you want to call it that, to them, because I know what the point is of the shot that I'm trying to do. I know what the point of the story is, what the character's trying to do, what the character's trying, trying to say, and why they're trying to say it. Um, so I can make better choices. Uh, and then like the second thing I do is just sit there and think for a while about some of the, my uh, what opportunities this presents for me physically and, and like in terms of acting choices and like possible business or possible ways of staging the characters, like what would be effective, you know, for that kind of thing. Um, and if it, if it has a particular staging problem to it, you know, if the character is doing something that's physically uh, tricky or something I don't know much about, um, I will actually have to research that a bit or do it or like, you know, if a character's knitting and I don't know how to knit, I'll have to figure out how that works. Um, uh, you know, so there might be like a specific physical problem that needs to be solved. I'm going to have to, you know, rope into this, into this performance or like be a part, be an ingredient in this performance. And if it is a physically tricky thing, I might actually start doing some thumbnail sketches about how to present that idea clearly. Then I'll get onto the specifics of the acting. Like, what are they actually going to do with their bodies and, and how are they going to go through this emotion and what's it going to do to their body? And, and that's the part where I sit in my chair and I imagine I get right in, in the right place and I try and go through it and like do something from the gut or from, from real and then go like, oh, what the hell did I do? And then <laughs> start making notes and, and stuff like that. Or, or maybe even shoot some live action rarely, but you know, you know, before I you know, get started, I'll, I'll do, go through that kind of work on it and then it's either start drawing and posing and like trying to put those tent pole poses and drawings the tent by tent pole i mean like a pose or a drawing that's going to hold the scene up you know like the major parts of the shot like this is this emotion these two characters is posed like this and then later on they're posed like this you know um so yeah then i'll start breaking it down that way you know yeah, that, that's, that's, that's kind of how i start <laughs> That's so insightful. Thank you so much. I think that's actually helped me a lot because that's something I'm starting to practice now. So thank you so much for answering that. Oh, you're welcome. And, and I don't sound British anymore, but um, I, was, my, uh, I hover somewhere over the mid-Atlantic, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I still hear it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sinan, Sinan Arslan, uh, she can't... Um, he or she can't hold the, um, get the uh, audio or uh, visual working, but um, she's wondering how you handle like timing and spacing. Okay, yeah, I look at timing and spacing. Um, they're very much, you know, you know, they're connected to each other very intimately, obviously, and you can almost call one thing the other. They're basically just kind of like uh, variations of the same thing, but one's in slightly more detail than the other, I guess. Timing, I tend to think about, in terms of just the broad strokes of time that you need to do something. And if something's gonna happen quickly over a few frames, like, oh, I'm gonna get from here to here in like roughly 12 frames or something. And I need to spend, you know, a good second and a half in this pose before I, you know, I, I find my, when I think about timing, it's like these windows of time where I'm actually moving between something or I'm basically staying in a place, mm -hmm. you know, these sort of blocks of time, you know, my timing. Um, and spacing is just like the macro version of that, right? Where it's like, okay, I know I basically want to transition from here to here in roughly 12 frames. How am I going to like actually do that? Am I going to, you know, pack a lot of drawings at the beginning, have a slow build and then a, am I going to get going really fast and spend a lot of time like cushioning into that? How am I actually going to control these drawings, where they are in space, how they move physically, 
um, mechanical considerations like, oh, I got to get the foot out there first or I'm not going to start properly or like I need to drag this part of their body, you know, go arc under with the head or, or you know, over with the elbow. <laughs> what, what's it going to take to make this interesting, uh, physically, uh, you know, powerful if it needs to be, you know, what, what sort of animation mechanics uh, are going to be involved in spacing out these individual frames within that window of time? That's what I think about timing and spacing. Got it. And often too, I, I think uh, quite often about not just going between these poses, like that, that's all I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about all the other pieces on either side of this, of this thing. So sometimes I think about going through a pose into the next piece. So that I'm not just going mechanically from pose to pose. A pose might be a stop along the way somewhere. Wow. Um, Zoe, are you on the line? Leonard? Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey. Yay. I'm first. <laughs> Hi, um, Zoe. How, how are you? <laughs> uh, first of all, you guys are like super big inspirations to me. So like, this is like amazing um, <laughs> that I, I'm, I'm able to do this. But I was kind of curious, you know, you got into animation at such an early age and like your actual career started off at such an early age. Um, was there ever a point that you experienced burnout? Um, and if that's the case, how did you deal with that? Um, and if you haven't really, like, how did you avoid it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, every, everyone experiences burnout, you know, to varying degrees, you kind of go up and down, you know, obviously at the end of like a really serious crunch on a movie, you can feel really burned out. I can't do all nighters anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously stepping away, taking a break, uh, detox, detoxing um, if you can uh, for a while. And I usually find that changing my input um, helps me creatively. And it's actually the same thing I do when I'm trying to learn a new thing. If I'm trying to learn about something new or if I'm trying to get reinvigorated about mm -hmm. the art, uh, I will sort of change my input on something. So, for example, like learning how to do the horses and stuff like that was a, it, it was a combination of like, oh, I'll go look at video for a while. Then I'll go look at books for a while until I get burned out on that. And then I'll go, and then I'll go look at some real horses for a while until I get overwhelmed with yeah. that. And, and you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like changing my input. So, so if I'm feeling burned out, apart from just <laughs> having a rest for, for a, a day or two, yeah. it's like um, going to something that, that is going to in, inspire me, whether it's watching a movie uh, or, or whatever it is, um, you know, a museum or what, whatever, just changing my input so I can get, I can't, I can't just do creative output with no input. Yeah. You know, I, burnout for me is about, not having any time to experience anything and you're con all you're having to do is sitting at a desk expected to produce you know and i can't just produce non-stop it'll eventually run dry and i need yeah. to like step back and have something come in rather than go out oh that's that's amazing that's what i do yeah thank you <laughs> good to see you Zoe. Yeah, uh, good to see you too. Thank you. So, like, this is like a huge moment. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Take a screenshot really quick, Zoe, before you're gone. <laughs> cool. Um, Autumn, are you there? Uh, yeah, I am. Hi, Autumn. Hey, <laughs> but um, I uh, just wanted to say um, I thought what you said about kind of like um, kind of working as a supervisor and an animator and then having that balance the fact that you you still make time to animate I thought that was really insightful because um, I've always kind of wondered like how do you have that balance like how do you move up you know in the career ladder in that way and still maintain that sort of animation back. But my question um, is more of a technical one. Um, I was looking at your demo reel and I saw this, this scene from um, the Hunchback of Notre Dame where he's lifting up uh, Esmeralda. And I've been, I like, I'm, I'm really curious about kind of how you do 
that kind of um, 3D camera where it's like, it's perspective, but it's like dynamic perspective. Mm. Um, I wondered about kind of like how technique wise and like what kind of um, resources um, one would need to, to look at to kind of. Yeah, there was a part of Disney where that was more common in their movies, right? Where you're doing like these hand-drawn movies, but occasionally they would have a CG background and they would do some fancy camera move. And then it was like, it's like, Oh, get James to do it. He'll he'll do like some crazy camera thing, right? Um, so obviously the camera move is done first. They will plan that out. Uh, I think it was Mike Merrill. Might not be Mike. I could. I'm not sure who it was uh, that did the camera move with the cathedral. And they had a little stand-in quasi who was like a little egg shape. He was basically just an egg, and and a sort of burrito shape for for Esmeralda sort of floating next to him. And literally, he, Mike animated those two shapes just drifting through the shot. Just like a couple of keys, just like, well, they just drift through the background. They don't animate. They're, they're there for size, you know, size comparison, right? Just to kind of give me a general sense of size and proportion, you know, for, for what I'm trying to put in there uh, eventually. But the act of animating those is, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's really difficult. Um, you have to, uh, plan it out really quite precisely what that that what i was talking about before like what's the character going to do that moment or that those decisions have to be planned not only in just like what are they going to do physically they have to be planned temporarily in time so i not only have to know like what's the character going to do i have to know actually kind of down to the frame when they're going to do it because when i start drawing it and i and i'll i'll I've got this huge stack of paper printouts of the background, just a wireframe version of the cathedral or something. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I will have thumbnailed some stuff about how I want Quasimodo to look uh, and, and do the staging where I go like, well, I want him to peer out underneath his arm here. And then the camera swings around and I want to be able to see his face underneath his arm from the other side as he glares down in the crowd before he takes that leap up onto the balcony. I want that moment. Which frame am I gonna pick <laughs> to put that on? So I'm going through my head like, uh, 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 watch, you know, get some timing on this. Uh, 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 okay, I'm gonna take a guess, frame 57. Fingers crossed, I will start doing that pose on frame 57 and actually like drawing that pose in, there in space trying to make it as in that space as I possibly can. Um, and then I'll literally start working from there. I go, okay, I know how I want to go oomph, oomph. Okay, 20 frames, uh, 16 frames between here and there. I'll go back, you know, to, to frame 49 and go, all right, I'm down here. And the camera will have moved between 57 and 49. So I have to like now start flipping 57 with 49 and I am to get them the right proportions I'm like cross-referencing between parts of the architecture. I'll literally draw lines out from the balcony, extend things of the architecture to go, no, his shoulder goes there, you know, <laughs> and I'll flip it to get this sort of sculpt, moving sculpture feel to him. It's the hardest when they're standing still. When they're moving around a lot, you can kind of get away with murder. But when they're standing still, that moment when he's actually holding her above his head and the camera just sweeps by, that's the hardest part to do because he just has to be there as a sculpture. Now, obviously in, in later movies, like there was a few on Spirit where I was going in and out of, of um, referencing a CG horse, which was underneath a couple of those shots. And instead of being a, a, an egg and a burrito, it was actually a, 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 an arm model version of Spirit that they had plopped in the, in the background. <laughs> So there was an accurate perspective version. He wasn't moving, but there was at least an accurate perspective version of the horse standing on the hill that I could like reference. So that was like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier <laughs> than doing that, those like that hunchback shot. Uh, but yeah, it's a process of like really honing in on the timing. It's the timing. Cause once you, once you have to commit to the time, because if you don't, then you can't change the timing later. You can't suddenly go like, oh, no, that would have been better on frame 69 because, oh man, that's an entirely different perspective. I'm going to have to redraw this whole thing. So you try not to do that. <laughs> Can I jump in here? Uh, I remember that day 
that James shot that test because I was, I don't know, 21, 22. And it was like, it took all day. It, it took hours to shoot it because it was like hundreds of frames of animation. And I think, wasn't it on 24 field paper, James, some of it? No, no, that was 16. Okay, so that was 16. But uh, I think e either you were shooting it or a PA was shooting it. I thought it was you though. I think I might've shot that one myself. Yeah, and I remember like it took hours. It like. Like we would come back, we would like look around the corner and James is still like, you know, shooting away, <laughs> shooting away. And then like we would go back to work and we would like call each other. Is he done yet? No, he's getting close, he's getting close. And we'd come back and look and he's getting close. And then finally like we heard, the word went out that like, okay, it's done. We're gonna hit play. <laughs> and so like, I don't know, there were like seven or eight of us. It was like me and probably Joe Mosier and Dave Pimentel and all these like young animators gathered around this monitor and James hit play and we were just like, like silence. And then like it started to turn into this like, oh, <laughs> people were like screaming like like Jake did a grand slam home run and it was incredible it was just like watching this happen real time seeing it for the first time we just didn't know how it happened what James just explained like our minds couldn't comprehend that it was just such a magical moment I totally remember that day anyhow oh, that's it? awesome I love that it was so good so good <laughs> I don't have to do those anymore maybe that's sad I don't know <laughs> I think it's good to, to like know how to do it. I think having the knowledge there helps you um, kind of when you're, when you're working, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's, having, it's, having a lot, it's having a bunch of experience so you know enough about timing that you, you can predict what it's gonna look like before you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's like always kind of been a question I've always wanted to know, but. Cool. <laughs> Oh, Bobby, you're muted. Oh, um, thank you, Autumn. Um, Luke, are you in the in the in the chat still? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I see Luke. Hey, Luke, what's going on? Do you want to ask your question? Luke's muted. Oh, there you he go. Hey, Luke, how's it going? I'm a. I'm Oh, I'm just waving at someone. It's a friend of mine. Oh, okay. uh, I'm doing great. How are you? Good. 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 Did you have a question for James? Oh, I do have a question for James. Uh, let me, uh, where's the questions at? Oh, no, no, no. You can just ask it now. Yeah. Oh. I can hear you and I can see you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what was your favorite film that you animated on and why? I have a few. Um, okay. As a movie, I really like the, the, the How to Train Your Dragon movie. The first How to Train Your Dragon, I think, is a really great movie. So I just really liked it as a story, you know, as, the, as, as being able to animate on something that has such a nice story to it. I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, from an animation perspective, I really enjoyed doing Lion King because I was doing Rafiki. And that was very much sort of like me sitting in a, in a room doing most of Rafiki by myself, actually. Uh, he's only on screen for about five minutes. So I got to do almost every shot of him in that film. So that was, a, that was just a pleasure, right? And also the fact that he was silly and he got to do some really fun stuff. That was really fun. And the other one I really enjoyed um, was actually Spirit, um, doing the horse uh, movie at DreamWorks because I learned a lot. And I intentionally went into it with the notion of learning a lot. So that was very gratifying, doing the horses. That's my answer. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for answering, James. You are right. one of my favorite artists working in the industry right now, and I'm glad to see you're still doing great, and I can't wait to see what the future brings for you. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get to work Take together care. later on. <laughs> thank you, Luke. Oh my gosh, you're so great. Thank you, Luke. Hey. Um, do we want to, um, James, how are you doing on time? Uh, Clay, how are oh, you no, doing? I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. Okay. I can go if you can go. Okay. Um, so, uh, Fozi, Ale Fozio, can you hear me? Hello. Hi. How's it going? Hi. I'm doing good. How are y'all doing? Good, good. Thanks That's for good. coming. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, I just had a question for like, I don't know, anyone of you can answer this, but 
so I'm still like a complete beginner when it comes to like animation, you know, so I'm just trying to find more ways that I can practice. So like, what are ways like, you know, besides the obvious bouncing ball that, you know, beginner animators could use to just get better, you know? Animation can be a bit daunting because you have to think of so many things at once, right? There's a lot of stuff you've got to like do all at the same time. Oh man, I've got to like, uh, do this character with a good pose and then I've got to do these expressions that communicate. Oh man, now I've got to worry about my spacing and I've also got to worry about like the mechanics and the walk or whatever it is. There's, there's a lot of balls to juggle. So I usually uh, try and say to try and separate some of these tasks out from each other a little bit. If you want to concentrate on communicating with poses, do like an animatic or like a storyboard of something where you're literally just concentrating on communicating with body posture and pose and but you're not really animating them you're doing sort of key poses like every you know 16 frames or every foot or you know every second or whatever it is that you might do if you are doing an animatic or storyboarding and you can concentrate on that side of the problem right your drawing your communication your expression then if you want to like try, oh, no, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try tackling like mechanics, body mechanics. Do stick figures. Don't worry about expressions. Don't worry about like body proportions or anatomy or any of that stuff. Do a walk with some stick figures. So you all you're concentrating about is the spacing. Where are the ups and downs? Where do the feet go? How do I make this into a cycle? But you don't have to worry about that crazy drawing stuff, right? So it's always good to try and sort of separate some of these tasks into different tasks. It's basically like a dancer being at, at the bar. You know, they, they're not doing the whole thing out on stage. They're just practicing their plies or they're practicing parts of the parts of the job, you know, so, but they're doing it separately. So you can like not have to be overwhelmed right at the very beginning. That would be my advice. If you're, if you're trying to, get to the next level. Okay. Yeah, that's great advice. <laughs> Good luck, man. <laughs> literally just sitting there doing it. <laughs> it's the I'll, best thing to do. Of LA FSEO. Um, sorry, before I go to the next question, uh, Clay, do you, do you want to interject there or anything like that? I, I don't mean to keep you hanging. No, no, no. I, I'm okay. very happy to hear, but I, I would say if, uh, aside from learning mechanics of animating, um, having something to say is very important. So if, you know, you have a story or something like it, it helps you in your storytelling, like I want to say this, so I have to animate this thing. It having something to, to communicate is, is if you, if you're trying to find like, having a hard time knowing what to animate or what do I do, just try to tell the story. And then that will tell you what you need to learn how to animate. And then you can kind yeah. of back it up and you can tell the story in stick figures or whatever those shapes are. But uh, that really helped me. Like, you know, you would be at Disney and you'd be like, I have to do this animation test. You're like, oh boy, what am I going to do? Or you have to do a story test. It's like, oh boy, what am I going to do? But when they're like, hey, this is the scene. You're like, oh, I know how to do that. You know, you have a, a purpose. So that could help. Can you, um, and man, that kind of like, tipping back of like, um, can you remember when I was trying to get back into Disney or trying to get into Disney and I was sending you stuff and that kind of stuff. So um, in Demo Reel Reviews, Clay, you talked about like, it's not, it's more about the entertainment, right? And not about the um, polish. You have to have that polish, but you want to quickly like touch on like, animators that are trying to get into Disney and what you guys are looking for in the room. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, James, you can- Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's no, 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 that's good, good. But yeah, <laughs> um, like polish is not as important as ideas. If a person comes and they show that they can, you know, acting is, is ideas and communicating and they, they're doing things that are fresh and like, oh, I've never seen that before. I've never seen a character, you know, fall down like that or sneeze like that in a shot. Like that's the stuff you're like, wow, that's a, an individual thinker. But if you see reels, they're kind of like cookie cutter, like, oh, boy, I've seen this reel a hundred times. Oh, look, the guy's, you know, climbing the wall and he's trying to pull the door open. But when someone does that test and it's like, oh, wow, that it's the ideas that matter. Um, polish and all that stuff. You can learn that sometimes and most of the time you can you can learn polish and learn how to re refine your work but if you don't have ideas you're just going to be an okay animator and it's going to be harder for someone to hire you right 
Um, yeah, nothing to add to that. <laughs> Julia, Julia, do you want to do you want to come on on board and ask James or play your question? Hi. Yes. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Turning on my video now. Do you, can you see me? Yes. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm so excited. I didn't think um, you would answer my question, but I actually asked. Uh, two questions, if that's okay. Can I ask them? Yeah, sure. Um, so because of the pandemic, I'm in my first year of uh, university and I'm enrolled in BA animation. And because of the pandemic, I didn't get to learn how to animate on paper, but we're all doing everything online and digitally. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think animating on paper actually teaches students and animators? Um, I like animating on paper just because I learned how to do it on paper. It's not essential though, it's actually how to learn how to do that. The thing I like about it, I think that, that is different than, um, you know, drawing digitally uh, on a pad or obviously doing any kind of CG. Um, it's just like the, the real touch of the pencil to the paper and, and how that's slightly different and the different sort of feeling you can get out of doing a drawing. Um, and then the fact that, you know, when I'm done, I get this nice stack of paper, which, you know, I, which, you, which is a real thing in real space and I can hold it. And it's not just a bunch of ones and zeros out in the world. You know, that, you know, those are the, basically the, the cool things. There's some really cool things about doing it digitally though, that you, you, you that it's hard to do with paper doing any kind of like corrections and retimings and, and uh, resizings and, and all sorts of things you can do digitally uh, are amazing. Uh, I think if there's something that the paper teaches you that it's harder to learn uh, digitally is the discipline of trying to get to that place where you uh, can predict what something is gonna look like before you shoot it. Uh, and it's something I sometimes encourage young animators to try in, in a moment when they're not trying to hit a deadline is to uh, try animating something. If you're doing it digitally, try animating something and not press play for the whole time that you animate it and just try and get, make your best guess as to how it's going to look. Right. And then when you're done, press play at the very end and go like, Ooh, that was not what I expected. <laughs> or, or like, oh, that part actually worked. Oh, yeah, it worked. Um, because the, the closer you can get to that experience of like having a pretty good guess of what it's going to look like before you press the button, it's gonna, you're going to be way more effective. And you just learn more about how animation really works, how, what a 24th of a second really feels like. Um, if you're constantly animating by trial and error, just like, oh, no, it didn't work. Oh, just erase that, it didn't work. You know, you'll never get over that sort of hurdle. Um, so I suppose animating on paper kind of does that for you a little bit. We, it forces you to get over that hurdle. Um, but, and, but eventually, if you have the discipline, you try that a few times, um, you can, uh, you know, get to a place where you can be a lot more effective as an animator because you, you have a better idea of what it's going to look like before you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's very insightful, yeah. Um, and I had another question, if I can ask that as well. Yeah. And um, I was wondering, what if there is something you uh, that that you learned through animation that actually changed how you view the world and the people around you? Because I know the you know the professor at university actually always tell me uh, observe and look at people. And, and then you, you get this sense of timing and, and spacing. And I don't know if there's something else you learned through. I had, I, I've never actually thought about it on such a deep philosophical level <laughs> about like, ha, has animation given me a better understanding of the human condition? You know, <laughs> um, I know that it has taught me to look carefully uh, at things. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always been better at uh, actually looking at, at things. I'm, I'm better at recognizing people from their walks from a distance sometimes than I am from up close with their faces. <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right up close with faces. I can do that. But it's just like, um, I find I actually kind of get surprised with people that cannot recognize someone from a distance by their walk. 
So it's taught me, I think, uh, or it's brought out in me a natural inclination to, to look carefully at things, um, for sure. Whether or not it's taught me anything about human personalities, I think it must have. Just having to examine my own emotions while trying to animate a piece of acting or trying to put myself in another person's shoes while trying to imagine a performance. Yeah, I suppose it must have given me a, a bit more of an insight or like a more of a connection to like other people's points of view. <laughs> but I haven't actually really considered that before. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for You're this welcome. opportunity. Really, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, that I mean that really made me quickly think. Um, and Clay, you'll know this of of that um, Prince of Egypt shot, the pantomime with it's all silhouettes. That's just what my mind goes to of just kind of like the body language and that whole acting bit. And what was it like, James? Like twenty seconds or something like that, where you know, you know which shot I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a shot in Prince of Egypt, which is like, uh, and it was one of the only shots I've ever had where where there there was no uh, time constraint really, mm -hmm. uh, and really kind of not much in the way of of storyboards. They they kind of like we've got this moment and just do something. <laughs> <laughs> Moses. There was no script, right? I mean, they had tried it with a couple of versions of dialogue with it and it always fell flat because you had just seen it on screen. It made no sense for him to be talking his way through it, but you needed to see her reaction to him like going, oh my God, this thing happened. And you needed to see her go, oh man, this is heavy. <laughs> so there just needed to be some kind of pantomime thing happening. So that was actually really interesting and fun to kind right. of like figure out like, what would be good to do here? What would he do? What would she do? And how can I make that clear from a distance without words? Yeah. Man. Yeah. That was a great shot. Did uh, you uh, write your own dialogue to guide yourself through that scene? Very much. Mm, not, not specifically dialogue, but I did like think about the moments that he was trying to describe. Got it. Got I didn't it. go down into individual words, but I definitely had like the, Okay, he's going to talk about the. He had to take his shoes off, and then he's going to talk about the, yeah. the staff, and then he's going to go like. And it was so incredible because it was all you know. I, I had like these. Yeah. Moments that he was trying. To and do. when we talk about like characters thinking, one of my favorite parts of that scene is when he's like, "And my clothes." He like grabs his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So good. Yeah. It's like he's like, "Oh yeah, there's that other thing," you know. That's just, yeah. 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 My favorite part of that uh, shot, that long shot, is just kind of like how he's like. Ah, oh, and then he just kind of like he's so overwhelmed by it, and he's like, I can't even talk anymore. And he just right. like, pace and kind of comes back. Yeah. Meanwhile, and, she's she's about three poses with charts as long right. as her leg. <laughs> like she's just sitting down, really, really. <laughs> Man, okay, yeah, that's cool. Before me and Clay geek out too much, uh, Kiafana, what do you think? Um, can you can you hear us? Can you come on board? Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, answering my question. Sure. So I think you've already kind of answered it previously, but I have a question about something that I call animation anxiety, wherein I'm trying to clean something up or draw some finish something up, and I kind of mess up. And then I played back and I realized that, oh, it's overshot the last frame a little too much. And then I'm just confused. And I tried to correct it back again. And I'm just messing it up again and again. So what do you do when you're in a situation like that, where you like, kind of, you got overwhelmed with the amount of drawings that you have made? And how do you get through something like that? I mean, I think I, if I'm unsure about a piece of animation, I'll always make sure I try and keep my rough version of it. Now, if you're animating in CG or something, uh, that could be harder to do, but always referring back to the play blast or something that you did before. Are you working in CG or are you working in hand-drawn? Hand-drawn, especially FX. Okay. So I would always make sure I have a version of it, my planning versions of something that I can refer back to 
and go like, what was my intent here? And like, what did I, where did I go off the rails? You know, to if something kind of morphed into something unexpected as I was yeah. going through it, right? Um, so making sure you have a version of it that you can refer back to is really like the number one thing, uh, I think for me. And, and, and like trying to analyze it, like what is the problem here? Like what, what have I done which is wrong? Have I, is it a mechanics problem? Have I, is the weight not right because I put a foot in the wrong place? Or is this slow and not right because, you know, is, the, is it a mechanical problem? Or is it a, a performance problem where I go like, oh man, I've just tried to cram too many expressions in, or too many acting thoughts into this one moment. Like I need to actually edit some stuff out, you know, and like those can be painful decisions where you go like, oh man, I've done a lot of work. I had this whole moment where they did this other pose and this other expression. It's just too much. Okay. Now I've got to re I got to tear this apart and Frankenstein it back together again in a way that makes sense. You know, that's, that's more clear and just feels nicer. And those can be hard things to do. Can, but I, I usually try and make sure I've kept a version of it where I had my original intent. And then I also try and analyze it from like, what's actually going wrong? Is it mechanical or is it performance, you know, related? Or is it just bad, bad drawing? Or <laughs> what's, what's actually the problem and then work the problem, try and fix it that way. That's kind of what I try and do when I have moments like that. Okay. Where are you right now? I want to ask you where, where you are. <laughs> I'm from India. Are you, there, are you there now though? Yeah. Congratulations for staying up so late. Uh, thank you. I can't it's okay. I really love these sessions and I get I was, to speak to people like very, you because... Very kind of you. <laughs> I always refer back to your videos on YouTube. I think it's posted by Spa Studios and to, to study about character animation because it's something that I want to get into eventually. So I always refer back to those videos and try to make sense of what you're conveying through all those techniques. That's awesome. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me and thank you for answering my question. Okay. I'd like to add on it's kind of what you're saying at the end there, James, where uh, I, when I was learning how to animate, it was so difficult for me. Like drawing was hard, animating was harder. And uh, I was so like, I would animate a scene and it wasn't working and I was, I would try to salvage it. I would try to make it work when it wasn't working. And I remember I, literally the day when I was like, I took it and I put it in the trash and started over. And that was such a freeing decision to make where I wasn't like so tied to all this work I had done because it wasn't working. I had to be honest with myself and it's, I'm not saying throw away everything that doesn't work, but allow yourself that like everything you make, you can't save it all. And you have to be able to be like, nope, that doesn't work. And th that really kind of like made me a better animator that day once I realized it's just drawings. Um, and I, I became less precious about the drawings and I became more scribbly and faster and, and more experimental when before I was just like, oh, it's gotta be perfect. And I had to save the drawing. And I was like, no, that's not important. The important thing is the result. And so letting that go was like a huge step for me in my career. That was like 20 years yeah. ago. <laughs> I, I learned that not by throwing it in the trash, but having Richard Williams throw it in the trash for me. <laughs> <laughs> he made the decision That's for you. <laughs> uh, James, James, Monica here. Can I just say, if you have any drawings that you don't like, just send them to my house. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Her house is my house. I like this idea. Oh, my. I thought you would. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Kirtana, really, oh, sorry, she went away. Um, really quickly, um, I, I felt like you had like a second question of just kind of like you followed James's like YouTube thing. Is there anything else that you wanted to ask him? Like, oh, okay. Are you sure? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming on and staying up in India. Woo! Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> I've, I've got time for maybe like two more, I think. Okay, two more. Okay, let's do it, James. Uh, um, so uh, let's do let's do Micah and Raven, right? And then Raven. Uh, Micah, are you on the call? Hello. Hi, Micah. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing this whole webinar thing. This is just really cool to be able to. Uh, Micah, so Micah, it's hard to hear you. I'm so sorry to mention it, but very hard to hear you. So it's like a whisper. 
Just turn the volume up a little bit. Turn your volume up. No, oh, it's off. Now I can't hear you at all. Yeah, I can't hear you at all now. Sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything, but. It was better before. <laughs> oh, poor thing. Oh, no. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you so much for doing the webinar. It's really cool to be able to ask questions. Um, and my question was, I'm sure you get this a lot, but do you have any tips for like beginning animators or like anyone who wants to prepare for animation? Because I'm still 15, really young, but I like want to go into animation in the future. Um, it's, a, it's such a broad question. It's always, hard, it's always a hard one for me to answer. But um, I always felt like um, doing some kind of drawing is good for you. Mm -hmm. um, even if you know that you're not ultimately a drafts person and that it's not going to be the way that you want to animate. Mm -hmm. Communicating with pictures is such a fundamental part of what we do uh, that it can kind of serve you well to like just try figuring out like how to communicate through a pose, how to communicate an emotion uh, through a pose um, is something good to practice. Even if you know that your drawings are not ultimately going to be great. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good practice to really start trying to figure out you know, how uh, emotions look when, when, you know, when they're put into poses, basically. Uh, oh, and, and, I, and, I w and I remember just looking at a lot of stuff, just looking at a lot of, like finding model sheets from old characters and, and seeing how they were drawn and how the characters were posed and what kind of things that the, the artists would do to communicate those poses and how they would angle the head or, or how they would draw the eyes or, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, so I would, I would try that for sure. Getting into the idea of communicating with pictures is the number one thing. So maybe I don't know, do a comic strip, <laughs> do, do, do something where you're, you know, having to communicate with, communicate emotions and actions through pictures. Mm. It's like the, the number one thing that you kind of have to learn how to do. Clay, what do you think? Yeah, I, eventually animation is storytelling. You're, you're telling ideas, so um, that for sure, I would say first, but also, you know, watch movies and watch how other people tell stories, read books. Like there's so much information that goes into animating. And I even found like when I was, you know, directing, even more information I had to pour into that, like the travel that I've done, the music I've listened to, like it's so bizarre how much it, all of that gets used. So just, keep taking it in. It, it won't be wasted. Whatever you can like ingest as fast yeah. as you can, um, none of it's wasted. It's kind of amazing how your brain works and it, it starts connecting these ideas and you become yeah. a better storyteller by <laughs> taking in stories I, and I, telling I, stories. Yeah, I will, I will say that, that um, there's a lot of great resources online uh, for learning how to animate. There's also a lot of resources online which basically kind of tell you how to do an animation program they don't really tell you how to animate. Yeah. So obviously some of these resources are better than others. If you want to go to books, I know a couple of books are pretty expensive, but The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston is, is a great book for sort of how to approach thinking about being a character animator. Yep. It's a really good to have a companion piece, more like Richard Williams's book, like Animation Survival Kit, or, or uh, Eric Goldberg's Crash Course book, which are a little bit more step-by-step step how to, yeah, the illusion of life is kind of expensive. <laughs> yeah, it, is, it is, but I look at it like this, James, and this is what I say to people, like if you're going to seminary school, you're going to read the Bible. And to us, yeah. I look yeah. at this is the animation Bible. So anyone who wants to be in the animation field, and I say that meaning in any, any job, like even a, like a producer, you don't have to just be an animator. There's so many other jobs in animating, as we all know. And, and reading that really is important. Yeah, it's not cheap, but you can get used ones and right. you can also sign up for Rise Up Animation. I know you're only 15, but if you have a, um, you know, a, a parent, you know, that is interested, they can sign up and bring you to this session. So yeah. I think it might be something that you ask your guardian, okay? Because yeah. right, you'll qualify, you. sweetie. Bye. Thank you. But that was the, that was the thing I did. Um, I was like, Clay, I just devoured all literature on the subject. <laughs> basically yeah 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 at 15 what were we all doing at 15 um Micah you're ahead of the game at 15 I think I was catching frogs in the lake in my backyard um, 
frogs in the lake at 15? Yeah, you're very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Thank you for no coming problem. on. Um, could I ask one more thing, if that's all right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we're almost out of time, so. Oh, quick. sorry. Um, when it comes to like imposter syndrome and comparing yourself to other artists, especially with social media, um, do you have anything like, do you have any tips for getting over that? Yeah, get over it. I mean, it's, it's like, um, you know what? One of the, one of the best, one of the best things, one of the best things, actually one of the best things that the whole James Baxter, the horse thing taught me was to do your thing. And, and and it was something that was told to me about my own work from somebody else, from from Penn Ward, who who said like, yeah, you know, th this person that I that I admire and their work is so amazing to me. Um, that's not me. I can find my own way to express who I am, and be you know, because myself and Penn are completely different kind of artists. You know, we do completely different kinds of work. I admire the hell out of what he can do in terms of storytelling and filmmaking. The guy's incredible. Uh, you know, just his, his filmmaking voice is so fresh and so interesting and so new and just blows my mind. The sort of mind of imagination that that man has, right? Mm -hmm. And then he looks at my work and goes like, oh, it's beautiful. Or it's like, you know, it has this thing that he really admires about it, right? Um, but he is, um, I'm talking about Penn Ward, uh, as far as the person in the chat saying, who is this person? Pendleton Ward, who created Adventure Time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, re it really is uh, sort of taking a step back and, and going like, that's great. I'm going to be myself. And, and, not, and, and not having the fear, getting rid of the fear of like people not liking what you do. That's the other, the, other, the other gift that Penn has. He has no fear. It's, or it seems to me he has no, he probably does, but it seems to me that he has no fear about like putting his work and what he feels like is his work out there. Brilliant. Mm, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, I hope you all have a great day and stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. you. You keep doing it. Oh, she's adorable. And then uh, Raven to close it out. Raven. It's one of our moderators from, um, <laughs> they created a mentee uh, discord mentee. and it's called the mentees of Rise Up Animation. It has no, I mean, the only relation to us is that we, you know, started this, but they started the discord. So hi, Raven. Hi, Raven. Hi. Hi. Oh gosh, the last two answers were great. Um, I'm actually struggling with a storyboard sequence right now and, and I have to like, realize I have to let go of some drawings and, you know, doing the Frankenstein thing and you know, start over, um, basically, and, and not be precious. Um, so my question was, uh, what do you do when you have a character that you can't relate to, uh, but you need to get a compelling performance out of that character? Yeah, I think a bunch of actors are, you know, not that I'm an actor, but uh, a bunch of actors and or animators uh, often have this problem. How are you going to relate to this person? Uh, um, I, and I think I usually go back to the story um, and like try and figure out like, what is it about the world that, that makes sense to them? Because basically everyone is like the hero of their own stories. You know, even the villains are, you know, you've probably heard it said, like the villain has to feel like the hero of their own story to themselves. Like what they're doing is right. So if you can't relate to someone, it's probably because you haven't figured out what it is that they want and why the world should make sense to them a certain way. You know, because every, like I said before, everyone feels like they're doing the right thing, even though to other people, they might, it might seem really odd or really weird or evil or, or, or whatever it is that you're finding hard to relate to. You know, so you have to just basically examine the character and their circumstances and, and figure out like, well, what is it that they're trying to get at here? Like why, what is the what is the need for them that needs fulfilling and how and why are they going about it in a certain way you know what what is it that's damaged them to make them make these what you think are completely crazy decisions <laughs> you know you you kind of have to go at it for examining their their character and their motivations and, and stuff but always remember that they think they're doing the right thing 
you know, that that's the way I usually try and approach it. If I don't, if I can't get a handle on it, or if it's, or if it's someone that's completely alien to me. Other than that, I don't have a, a, a huge amount of difficulty just trying to imagine myself as something else, as like a, you know, a dragon or a, a mermaid or, or whatever. Uh, I usually don't have too much of a problem just like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to be a mermaid or, you know, um, and, and I think also giving yourself enough sort of cultural underpinnings, experiencing enough stuff so that if I have to do bell running to the top of the hillside and singing your heart out, the fact that I've seen the sound of music a lot helps. <laughs> You know, giving yourself enough cultural ammunition to be able to do things like that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you, Raven. Uh, and then Clay, I'll let you close it out. Um, and then we can call it a day, guys. Enjoy your Sunday. But uh, this has been wonderful. And so Clay, I mean, James, I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, all I can say is, one, thanks, Rise Up, for inviting me to do this. And two, James, thank you for, for this opportunity to catch up. I mean, I always love talking animation with you, so I'm honored. It's my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, we're just so grateful, James. Like, this has been, like, monumental. We've had some amazing people join us, but having you coming on, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome. It was so much fun. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, James. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Have a great everyone. Saturday. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend.